Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Molly's Salon. This is our weekly program every Thursday evening where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And we're living through a critical time in American history. The COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social, social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. And right now we are living through the election. Um, pretty uh, intense and amazing last few days. Our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as always showing us glimmers of hope for the future. And I have a wonderful roster of guests this evening to take your mind away from your television sets. Um, Nikiko Suzuki McAdams, who's a terrific set designer. Maria Rizzo, who's a wonderful actor and singer and Paul Sportelli, who's an excellent composer and musical director. My first guest is Makiko Suzuki McAdams. She is a theater set designer whose work has been seen on Broadway at many regional theaters across the country and in her native Japan. Arena audiences have seen her work in The Heiress and in The Little Foxes. And uh, Makiko should be joining me in just a moment. And there she is. Hi, Makiko. Hello. Hello. It's so good to see you. And good to see you. Makiko, I was just thinking about someone uh, who I know you are a great fan of, and I'm a great fan of, uh, because he worked at Arena Stage many, 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 many times. It was one of his homes. The great, iconic set designer, Ming Cho Lee, who yeah. just died recently. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about Ming because our audiences know him mm -hmm. and know his work on projects like K2. Yes, uh, well, he he was my teacher and um, uh, uh, and I actually surprised that the, I, I graduated uh, uh, Yale School of Drama like 2002. So it's been a little while and, um, but I, I actually had a, quite unexpected emotional reaction towards his uh, passing. And um, I tried to remember what he said to me and what I learned from him. And then uh, now I'm teaching too. And then like uh, what I'm teaching is like uh, kind of, I, I wanted to be true to what I learned from him because like, I think uh, I learned so much from him. And, uh, but, um, and then also like I looked uh, some, I, mean, he, I flipped his book and I read my friend's tribute towards him. And what he tries to teach us is like, always like what and uh, why we do theater uh, is the more most important thing. And, and then like, uh, we, we, of course we need to know how, that's what he said too. And then said, there's some video we can watch too, but the, um, he was a great dramaturg. Um, and, um, and also I think I could ask um, very sort of like a simple question and then he, but yet complicated question yet like he was answering like the words like I could understand and what he tried to teach me example for example like I, I was like I was like so lost and I didn't know what the set designer's job is and I asked him like what are you trying to teach me and then like what is set designer's job and we talked about that and I was fortunate enough to work with him too and he was idle when I didn't know like uh, before I became his student and he took me in and also like a huge part of it is like uh, um, he became set designer um, uh, like uh, before and during those uh, like uh, even like civil uh, um, you know civil rights movement and he's he was uh, immigrant Asian Chinese American uh, set designer and that was a huge part of uh, my learning from him and wonderful I, um, wonderful yeah and uh, such a big personality he adored his students, mm -hmm. uh, his famous clam bake in, uh, in New York where he would show everyone's work. And he, he asked you that question, why do you do theater? And mm -hmm. Makiko, why do you do theater? Why do you do set design? 
I th why I do theater. Um, my motivation changed time to time. Like I thought like scenery is the biggest thing on stage. So that's why I want to do, that's how it's begun. <laughs> and then, um, but like now it's just like the importance of storytelling. I just wanted to be part of this energy and the importance of like passing the story out. And, but like, I don't have much, um, I honestly don't have, um, a, desire to be uh, uh, to to lead those uh, process so like a director is not my place and then like uh, but like I, I really wanted to be part of it and I think I looked for where what I can do in theater and a set design was uh, something I found like probably like I, I, I just probably was good at or like I, I, it, it, when I like it, live theater we don't really um uh make a lot of money let's say <laughs> and then and then so like i thought about like going to do the tv work or a film job where like i just did a little bit of industrial design job but like when i realized that like i'm just like helping my friends doing a little props or like help like going to some theaters who needs help to paint and um uh, I just absolutely loved doing the work towards live theater and live storytelling. And I realized like it uh, didn't matter where I am, but I wanted to find my place in live theater. And uh, but I, I was fortunate enough to somehow keep going with the set design area of work right now. No. I'm so curious because you've been a set designer both here in the United States and in your native Japan. And mm -hmm. what's what's the difference between the two? Uh, the system is different. Like we don't have, a, we don't really have a regional theater system there. And, but like it is like, you know, many local theaters does things, but like where I grow up, uh, one theater, it's public theater, like a city run theater. Many of the theaters are city run. And some of them are like company owns the theater. And then, but like I worked at the city uh, run theater, which have to cover everything, like like film showing to lecture to like blast band, um, uh, concerts to ballet recital to everything. And then like sometimes like something like kind of the uh, professional theaters and uh, commercial theaters come to those my area, and then like go into those same theater. And so like we we called like multi multi-purpose theaters like it, it, there's so many theater like that but like in Tokyo like you know capital like they have some theaters like um, uh, uh, you know 100 seats theaters to do small uh, play or there's much more like specifically built like you know this is for the opera or so it's a it's a it's a different very different there and um, uh, when I learned about the regional theater system here, like I thought it's just kind of amazing, like how regionally uh, artists are putting the, or artists and then like uh, producers are putting efforts to reaching out to the community more um, very differently from like where I was. Wonderful. And Makiko, I see we just have one minute left. Oh, <laughs> um, it's already gone so quickly, um, but I would, love for you to talk about where are you finding joy these days these days uh you know what like at zoom like it's so many zoom meetings but like i reconnected with uh, many friends i ha i didn't have time to or uh you know, it, it's just like, it's great. Like I had, a, I have very many reunion of all the friends and um, and also I met new group of people by, uh, I, I've been participating in many of like BIPOC artist uh, discussions and like how we can um, participate better change for the future uh, American theater. And uh, it's it's been great to meet new people and also reunited with older, older people, or older friends and old friends. <laughs> Wonderful, Makiko. Yeah. 
it's great to talk to you. Good and to talk I to would, you. Thank you for uh, having me. Absolutely. And uh, your work is beautiful, and I can't wait to see it again on stage. So thank, <laughs> thank you for you. coming thank on. Thank you. Bye. So wonderful. I think Makiko is exactly right. Um, when we look at the strengths of uh, this time period, being with family and friends in a whole different way than we were before is got to be one of the strengths. Maria Rizzo is an actor and a singer. She performs all over the Washington area, including Signature Theater, Only Theater, Keegan Theater, among many others. And arena audiences will remember her from Anything Goes and Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, Fiddler on the Roof, I feel very happy because when I cast Maria, I, I must have cast her perfectly because I cast her with a young man who became her husband, Kurt Boehm in Fiddler on the Roof. So I guess I'm the matchmaker. You did it. We say it's your fault, all your fault. And now I'm stuck married in a pandemic. He's either gonna divorce me or impregnate me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one never knows with you, Maria. Uh, for our for our audience, we had we had a lot of fun before uh, coming on tonight because Maria was wearing a cream colored sweater and wanted to change into another sweater, so she probably made three changes of different sweaters. I, just I think blended the into the couch; it didn't work. <laughs> but the blue looks great on you. So blue for. I'm curious about what are you doing during the pandemic that you never thought you'd do? <laughs> um, I'm eating everything in sight and um, drinking everything in sight. Um, but a uh, wonderful thing is um, my husband and I got a, a new puppy and it's been taking all of our um, love and attention and um, positive energy for sure. And just, we've been putting it into Tony who's six months. And are you a good trainer for your puppy? I think so. I sound like my like my Philadelphia comes out when I when I say Tony, but it's been like it's I get we get so wrapped up in him. It's really hard to be mad at him. So hopefully I'm not spoiling our dog. But he's he's pretty chill and he's a good boy and he's super lovey, um, which is I think what we all needed uh, um, selfishly during this time. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we had such a great time working together at Arena. We talked a lot uh, during Anything Goes about updating the play because of the insensitive portrayal of the Asian characters. Really? And um, we did a lot of interesting work too on Fiddler on the Roof. And I'm just curious, what do you think we get to learn from the gold standard musicals that you don't learn from other musicals? Oh my gosh. So. They're classic for a reason, and we retell them because um, sometimes sad and sometimes happy history repeats itself, or it, they're um, issues that are that um, stay um, prevalent. And like, take West Side Story for example. You know, it's a a story about two opposite sides that um, conflict with one another. You know, that's a um, a classic show that sadly still, you know, has such an effect. Same with um, Fiddler and and. Um, so many themes in that and, and themes in um, anything goes and um, as as the, the list can go on all the shows that I see at arena that that really um, push into the important issues and like you always say reflect the world around us at present and I think it's so great that we get to revisit those themes whether good or bad just to make away make our, ourselves aware or make our audiences aware most important importantly and um, but also with a bit of fun with a song and dance, that could be nice too. Something that um, relieves us or lifts us out of whatever time that we're in and, and transports us in a way. Maria, where did you train as an artist? Uh, I had no formal training other than um, Catholic University. I went to CUA for um, uh, theater and um, I started dancing there. I didn't, um, I started, um, taking voice lessons then and there. So it was right out of the can and it's been fun. And it was nice getting to study something that you always had a, I always had a passion for. So it was cool. It, in, the, in this time of emotional stress around uh, the elections, we were talking about it earlier. 
Can you think of any musicals or plays that we need to be looking at uh, that would be important or can, or have you thought of any role that you would absolutely love to do once all of this is over? I wish I had like a really profound answer for you. I know um, there are just so many stories about um, injustice or about um, the, I, I think right now more than ever, we need to be telling stories from perspectives that are um, different from ours and or learning from um, people that are um, different from us. And um, while yes, it reflects the world that we live in, trying to bend a little bit as well and trying to push the narrative of something that may be uncomfortable for a second, but can be done in a way that, um, that 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 tips the scale maybe and um even if they are like the, those gold standards and stuff um trying to um visit it from another light even um you know i want to do maggie the cat from um cat on hutch and rip but i'm tr and i'm trying to think of like something that i could that is like i said more profound but <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no it it would be a great great role for you well you know, i, I, I I, I kind of have a sneaking suspicion that the that the kinds of projects that we're going to want to see when this is over is a combination of soul and champagne, because what happened in 1918 is two years later it was, you know, the Roaring Twenties. Right. So well, there's, yeah. I think that there's going to be some part of what happens where where we're just we're just going to want joy and pleasure. Exactly. We're just going to want to move into that. We can't like, we, I, especially when we come back to this, I think people are going to be so um, excited to be back into a theater in itself. And if it's like more of like what we see on the news, you know, and less of the escape or less of the joy and the fizz that you say, like that might, that's a great conversation to be having, exploring where this, where on the spectrum our art is going to be. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I actually think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a real combination of of those two. Um, I know that Kurt and Laura are there, and do you want them to poke their heads in to say oh, hello to us? So jealous. He are just, they there? Are they there? Laura is here. She's going to come on. Um, Kurt just took Tony out for a walk as he was um, being a little butthead. But all right, I was not. All right, there she is. Hi, how are you? It's oh, so good to God. see you. This it's is, so good to see you. This is Instagram and then this is reality. Get out of here. Well, I was literally on the floor. We were just like talking. I was like, put it like, I was like, I don't even know how to do makeup anymore. And we were laughing with each other. Laura's in my pod and we've been very safe with each other for the last um, couple months and stuff. Just being super cautious and aware, especially of each other's families and, and what have you. But it's so good to have people you love around. Well, you got to have those pods, right? You got to, you got to have them. You have to have the people who you know are taking it seriously, yep. you know, both for your soul and for your health, right? Yep. And like, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you guys do that's really fun? Uh, well, we just went on a little staycation. We left, um, we just had a, <laughs> we left, we went so far, we went to Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, I mean, let me tell you, seeing the, um, seeing the state turn blue again um, this round was, certainly a relief because we were in like middle of Virginia and I was like are we sure that it's a blue state yeah northern Virginia is a we're in, we're in a nice little bubble up here for and sure you drive about an hour or so and it's not not as a you know nice feeling so. yeah but our staycation was great in our beautiful cabin oh, it was great it was so autumnal <laughs> so yeah it's it's like it's really time to get out in nature isn't it mm -hmm. you get out in nature and everything kind of disappears it's like this, like this. It's, like it's the saving grace too. Like, especially with, we were talking with Paul earlier, who's your next guest, but is such a, like, it's such a refresher almost to just turn off CNN or whatever you're watching and, and just walking amongst the foliage. <laughs> it's so great. Well, you guys, um, time's over, if you can believe it. Um, love your yellow fingernail polish. Maria, just show it to our guest, would you? And so I need it this year. So you're, ca you're catching me at the worst. I'm getting one tomorrow because it's they're growing out. It looks great. It looks great. 
It's great to see you both, and I can't Love wait to uh, see, see you both Love on stage. You. Love All right. you. Love you both. Take care. Bye-bye. That's fun. Uh, I think there's a theme around uh, friendship. Uh, today we were talking about Makiko and uh, coming together with friends. And then, of course, we have uh, Maria with Laura. Uh, next up is Paul Sportelli, and he's a musical director and composer. He's a resident at the Shaw Festival in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, but works all over Canada and the United States. And uh, I've loved working with Paul. And here he is. Hi, Paul. Oh, Paul, you have to unmute yourself. You, there you go. Hello, Molly. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Isn't that like the phrase of the last few months? You're on mute. You have to <laughs> unmute yourself. I think that's been our life, right? You're you're on mute. Today, somebody said that to me, and I said, "Oh, I was just following Zoom etiquette. <laughs> if you're not talking, put yourself on mute so that everybody can hear everybody else." That's right. Um, Paul, we've been so lucky to work together uh, many times, uh, both in Canada at the Shaw Festival and at Arena Stage, and I really love your sense of the music and that you work so closely with the performers. And we just had two performers that you've worked with before, which is kind of fun. Um, talk to us about how you integrate character into music. Well, I, you're right, Molly. I love the intersection of text and music. And I like to really sort of drill deep and try to understand why the composer and the lyricist wrote what they wrote, the way they wrote it, and then to hopefully ignite something in the actor uh, that helps them into their character, to use the actual primary source material of what you know, the composer and lyricist wrote to, to lead them into a greater understanding of their character. Well, you do a beautiful, beautiful job with that. So I'm curious, I just wanna take a little right turn here for a moment. Okay. So you're in Canada Yes. What do you think about the way American politics are being handled in the press, both in Canada and if you want to talk about the United States too, with everything that is so fraught in this moment, how are you following everything? I mean, you're an American and you're also a Canadian, so you are you live in both worlds. It is fraught. Um... You know, the day after Trump got elected in 2016, I got my online digital subscription to the Washington Post and the New York Times, which I read every day. I also follow the Canadian papers um, and the media. It's, it's hard. I will tell you that um, Canada is very, very interested in this election and very interested in what's been happening in the States and, and uh, very empathetic, I would say. Uh, but it's a, it's a crazy time, it really is. I, I think back to, we were doing Carousel. I think it was, election night was our second to last preview. And um, it just felt like a gut punch, you know? It was, it was just crazy. Um, so I, I would say my experience of the last four years, and I think many artists, is just like, what is your relationship to the news, to the media? How much of it do you consume? And when do you just need to like turn it off? Now, do you feel the same way about social media, Paul? Do you need to turn it off sometimes or do you let it go for a while or then and then come back to it? Are you the same way with that? I am. And, and what I've actually found during the pandemic is I've been a little bit more off it. And that wasn't a conscious decision. It was just something that started happening. Um, Maybe at the beginning of the pandemic, since most of us found we had more free time, I might have been on it a bit more. On some level, maybe it just didn't feel right to be on that much more. So I think all of us just have to find our relationship with social media and, and what feels right in terms of how, how on it we are. Well, it must be really important for you to be off of it, Paul, because you are a wonderful composer as well. And to be able to have uh, that time when you compose, you need to be introspective uh, as opposed to extroverted, which a lot of social media is much more extroverted uh, activity. 
and I'm really uh, curious if you would uh, talk to our audience about the newest project that you and Jay have been working on. Uh, well, first of all, you're absolutely right about, um, all, I think all artists, writers, as well as performers, they need downtime. I, I wish I could remember, I heard a great radio program and someone was talking about being in receiver mode or not in receiver mode. And I think when we're on social media, we are always in receiver mode. And I think it's really important sometimes to not be in receiver mode as an artist to kind of just let things percolate or to see, you know, what, what starts to come up inside of you that might result in the next writing project you have or what you bring to your art. Um, in terms of the latest musical that uh, Jay Turvey and I, my writing partner and partner in life, uh, have been working on is a musical called Eric with a K. It's based on the life of Eric Satie uh, and his contemporaries. Uh, so we've been working on that for a couple of years and are just about to start a new draft. We've, we've been away from the material for a while and which is always a great thing because then you can come back to it with fresh eyes, fresh ears, and hopefully take it to the next level. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm curious about conducting an orchestra in a pit because it's nearly as close as people can get outside of a submarine. And what do you think is going to happen with the orchestra pit in the future? I bet well, you're thinking a lot about that. Yes. At the Shaw Festival, we're, you know, we're hopeful for a, a 2021 season. Uh, I'm hopeful to go into rehearsals at the end of March next year. Uh, but we've already been having discussions about moving some of the musicians out of the orchestra pit uh, so that we can have proper physical distancing. Um, so yeah, we're, it's not ideal. I love the, I love that submarine feel, as you say, of just all of us together in a room making music together. Uh, but that's probably not going to be safe. We'll keep looking at what the, the science tells us, what the protocols are, but right now it looks like we'll be moving some of our orchestra out of the pit and uh, for everyone's safety. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Where will you put them? You'll put them into another space and then the, and then the, the uh, sound designer will make sure that everything blends beautifully. Exactly, yes, I thought, I, I thought oh, I should, I should mention that because that's gonna really confuse the, the audience here. But yes, they would be in another room listening to the show on headphones and watching a video monitor of me conducting. And then they would be playing and they would be uh, on mic. And so then the sound designer would be controlling everyone's sound. It's just that it's actually pretty common. You know, there, there are many Broadway shows where the orchestra's in another building yeah. or a faraway room. Um, we even had some fun, didn't we, with Carousel that some of us were in sort of the traditional arena orchestra pit and some were way up top. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a risky proposition. I remember that first time in the theater when I went to give that first downbeat and I thought this could just be a disaster, but it ended up being great fun and it worked out beautifully. <laughs> I remember that too, Paul. <laughs> Paul, we just have a couple minutes left and I would love for you to talk about either where you're finding joy these days, or if there's like a great book or a great music that you're listening to. Um, I will tell you where I am finding joy. Uh, in nature, N not that I don't find it in many places. I, I meet with my family on Zoom once a week now, and it, it, we're, we're probably seeing more of each other and having more substantive conversations than ever. But when we all went into lockdown in mid-March, uh, I started going on lots of walks and to be able to watch early spring turn into later spring, into summer, now into fall, into winter, to actually experience like the same walk and how different nature looks and how the days are getting longer, now they're getting shorter. I think one thing that's gonna be hard for me is I've really gotten used to like enjoying a later dinner and, um, sitting out on a porch and watching nature, watching day turn to night. And, you know, that's not the life of a theater artist. It's an early-ish dinner. And then it's like, get yourself to the theater for the half hour call. 
So we'll, we'll see how all that goes. But it, I, I have loved um, just really being a part of nature and, and observing the changes in nature. I just saw Maria sent us a note that said, yes, Paul. Uh, so I think she's enjoying nature too. I'm, I'm hopeful because I think that that's a common theme for people is that as we look at and grapple with climate change, that people all over the world are in a whole different place because of the pandemic. Very true. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Well, Paul, it's been so great to talk to you. Uh, right before I came on with everybody, I showed them, I just made a Russian apple cake um, because I- It looks I, delicious. I feel a need to celebrate tonight um, because I think that there may be a moment of celebration to be had if, if Pennsylvania comes in in a, in a hopeful way. Um, but I love seeing you. I can't wait to work together again and I give my love to everybody in Canada. Thanks, Molly. It's been great talking with you as well. Bye-bye. So what a great trio of people. So different. All artists are different and distinctive and so much fun to talk to all three of you. My guest next week will be Kenneth Lynn, award-winning playwright and screenwriter. Uh, he wrote Kleptocracy at Arena Stage. Betsy Morgan, uh, who's an actor and singer, Broadway and Arena Stage's Carousel that Paul mentioned. And Mary Catherine Nagel, playwright and partner at Pipestem Law. And she also is the writer for Sovereignty uh, which is a play that we produced a few years ago that is really about Native American treaties and uh, very exciting work, uh, treaties past and present. So thank you all very much. I know everybody's probably going to be running to their televisions now. Thanks for joining us. And Nick Jensen just said heaps of love to all three of you. Love you too, Nick. And uh, everybody, be safe out there and um, much love to you. Bye-bye.